Hey everyone, welcome to KSSP Podcast. I'm Spencer. I'm Katie. And in today's series, we're going to be talking about food waste. With that, we'll be going over a couple of different topics. One of those topics being prevalence. We'll go over some statistics on how common food waste is. And we're also going to be talking about why it happens. And we'll go over a couple of different factors that lead to food waste. And then we'll also cover why it matters. We'll discuss why it's important and why we should all care. And finally, we're going to be talking about what could be done. Um, We're going to go over a couple different potential solutions we could use to tackle the problem of food waste. So to get started today, we are going to be talking about prevalence. With looking at the prevalence of food waste, we're just going to be going over a bunch of statistics here. So first we're going to use our a source of the usda.gov slash food waste slash facts and with that we're going to look into how much food waste there is in the united states so in the united states food waste is estimated at between 30 to 40 percent of the food supply this estimate based on estimates from USDA's Economic Research Service of 31% food loss at the retail and consumer levels corresponded to approximately 133 billion pounds and $161 billion worth of food in 2010. This amount of waste has far-reaching impacts on society. Wholesome, so how? Um, Wholesome food that could have helped feed families, is sent to landfills. And then land, water, labor, energy, and other inputs are used in producing, processing, transporting, preparing, storing, and disposing of discarded food. In 2015, the USDA joined with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to set a goal to cut our nation's food waste by 50% by the year 2030. So what baseline estimates of food loss and waste will be used to measure progress in reaching the 50% reduction goal? Well, according to the USDA, the United States currently does not have a single baseline estimate of food loss and waste. Instead, two very different measures describe the amount of food loss and waste in the United States. So... For EPA, their estimates, 2010 was selected as a baseline at 218.9 pounds of food waste per person sent for disposal. The 2030 Food Loss Waste Reduction Goal aims to reduce food waste going to landfills by 50% to 109.4 pounds per person. And USDA estimates, amount of food loss and waste from the food supply at the retail and consumer levels in 2010. 2010, food loss and waste at the retail and consumer levels was 31% of the food supply, equaling 133 billion pounds and almost $162 billion. Neither estimate provides a comprehensive evaluation of food loss and waste in the United States. However, reductions in both these estimates will provide evidence of progress in reducing food loss and waste and the serious environmental impacts associated with landfilling food. A variety of other data collection efforts across the country will help provide on other segments of the supply chain. So, food waste in the U.S. and Europe is a major issue, with over one-third of food produced in the U.S. never eaten, and up to 60% of fish caught discarded in Europe due to supermarket quality standards. This results in the wasting of resources and significant environmental impact, including land use, water use, pesticides, fertilizer, energy, and GHG emissions. In 2010, food waste added up to 133 billion pounds and $161 billion in value. Half of all produce is thrown away in the U.S. due to appearance, and food waste is the largest material in U.S. landfills, accounting for 24% of all waste. 
The environmental impact of U.S. food waste is higher than most other countries, with each unit having a greater impact due to the waste of more animal products and the food being wasted downstream. Currently, the U.S. wastes more food per person than any other country. And then just a few more stats here. So overall, 80, about approximately 80 million tons of surplus food are not consumed. 54.2 million tons go to landfill or incineration or are left on the fields to rot. Farmers, manufacturers, households, and other businesses in the United States spend $408 billion each year to grow, process, transport, and dispose of food that is never eaten. And uh, all this about averages to 614 kcals per person. And it ends up amounting to 60 million tons of fruits and vegetables, the ones when they're thrown away if they don't look good enough. Estimates that include food lost or wasted during all stages of the food supply chain from primary production to consumption range from 73 to 152 million metric tons, which is 161 to 335 billion pounds per year, or 220, 223 to 468 kilograms, which is 492 to 1,032 pounds per person per year, equal to approximately 35% of the U.S. food supply. And roughly half of this food is wasted during the consumption stage, so at home and food service, and fruits, vegetables, dairy, and eggs are the most frequently wasted foods. And... Some more numbers here. So, each year, food loss waste embodies 560,000 kilometers squared or 140 million acres of agricultural land, which is an area the size of California and New York combined. 22 trillion liters or 5.9 trillion gallons of blue water, equal to annual water use of 50 million American homes. 350 million kilograms or 778 million pounds of pesticides, 6,350 million kilograms or 14 billion pounds of fertilizer, which is enough to grow all the plant-based foods produced each year in the U.S. for domestic consumption, 2,400 million juge or 664 billion kilowatts, I think, of energy, enough to power more than 50 million U.S. homes for a year, and then 170 million GHG emissions, excluding landfill emissions, which is equal to the annual CO2 emissions of 42 coal-fired power plants. And then this uneaten food also contains enough calories to feed more than 150 million people each year, which is far more than the 35 million estimated food insecure Americans. So as we mentioned, a little more than a third of food produced is wasted worldwide. So just a couple numbers to start off with. An estimated 20% of food waste is on farms and storage or transit in industrialized countries. And in less developed countries, an estimated 30% is lost from inadequate storage, drying, or cooling and transportation. Now, food waste and farming, specifically, uh, weather, pests, and disease account for a large portion of the food waste. Farmers can be financially barricaded from harvesting crops if the market's sets prices too low, or if they can't afford the cost of labor. And large amounts of produce are waste because quality standards based off of the market aren't met. So these can include the shape, size, color, or the ripeness of the product. And people may want to place the blame on farmers for this, but if the food will be eaten, then it's a waste of time, money, and labor to try and harvest it. They're also beholden to the standards of the market. And specifically in grocery stores, they overstock their shelves and accurately predict shelf life. They encourage their customers to buy more groceries than they need and damage products. And all of this contributes to food waste as well. So in the U.S., grocery stores waste 9.6 billion pounds of food per year. And 90% of grocery retailers say that reducing food waste is an important issue for them because they're going to save more money that way. 
Uh, however, over 50% say that they lack the managerial support and technological resources to effectively deal with it. And in restaurants and other food services, uh, they contribute to food waste with poor menu choices, oversized portions, and mismanaged inventory. About half a pound of food is wasted per meal in a restaurant. This is from customers leaving food on their plates as well as common kitchen practices. And approximately 85% of the food that isn't used in a typical American restaurant is thrown out, but only a small percentage is recycled or donated. So the most commonly wasted type of food, these include, so 46.2% of potatoes, beets, radishes, and carrots are wasted. For fruits and vegetables, it's 45%. And then 34.7% of tuna, salmon, shrimp, and other seafood, 29.1% of cereal, bread, and rice, 22.1% of lentils, green peas, chickpeas, and seeds that make oil, 21.5% uh, of chicken, beef, and pork, and then 17.1% of milk, yogurt, and cheese. So rather than focusing on social and cultural factors, most studies on food waste focus on individuals and their actions. Uh, this can be kind of problematic if we don't focus on all of these factors here because not focusing on social and cultural factors, that's going to just lead to more misunderstanding on food waste. But okay. And then more than 42 million are food insecure people in the US. So if we were better able to allocate our food waste, we would be able to help these people with food insecurity. So now that we have shown just how prevalent food waste is with a lot of stats, <laughs> we're gonna be going over why this happens so we may be wondering why that happens and we're gonna look into a few different causes as to why that happens so this again is from usda.gov slash food waste slash faqs so what causes food loss and waste according to the usda food loss occurs for many reasons with some types of loss such as spoilage occurring at every stage of the production and supply chain. Between the farm gate and retail stages, food loss can arise from problems during drying, milling, transporting, or processing that expose food to damage by insects, rodents, birds, molds, and bacteria. At the retail level, equipment malfunction, such as faulty cold storage, overordering, and culling of blemished produce can result in food loss. Consumers also contribute to food loss when they buy or cook more than they need and choose to throw out the extras. So let's look at some different policies here. So today's U.S. food and agriculture system is influenced heavily by taxpayer-funded subsidies and other policies created by Congress and implemented by the USDA and more often than a dozen other federal agencies and departments. And these federal farm subsidies, as well as these other policies, push farmers to focus on a few commodity crops grown in ways that create costly downstream problems that taxpayers and others must clean up. So we're going to look into a couple of these programs more in depth. So first we'll go over, this is also from the USDA Economic Research Service. And this is government programs and risk. So some major risk management programs. There's the federal crop insurance, which was established in the 1930s to cover yield losses from na most natural causes. It operated on a limited basis up through the early 1980s when insurance availability was greatly expanded and premium subsidies were increased in the hope of replacing the disaster payment program. Major reforms were legislated in 1994 and 2000. These included the introduction of CAT, 
catastrophic coverage and large increases in premium subsidies. In the mid-1990s, revenue insurance was introduced into the federal crop insurance program and has since become the most popular form of insurance. Whereas crop yield insurance covers only yield losses, crop revenue insurance pays when gross revenue, yield times price, falls below a specified level. More than 290 million acres are insured under the federal crop insurance program, including more than 80% of the acres of major field crops planted in the United States. Then there's crop disaster payments, which are payments that were made in the past directly to farmers on an emergency basis when crop yields were abnormally low due to adverse growing conditions. During the 1970s, there was a standing disaster payments program with payments made without declaration of a disaster area. Regular payments ceased after 1981, but since then, ad hoc disaster payments have been specially approved by Congress on a number of occasions. A standing crop disaster program, the Supplemental Revenue Assurance Program, was established under the 2008 Farm Act, but was not renewed in 2014. And then there's the Supplemental Coverage Option, which was introduced in the Agricultural Act of 2014 and continued by the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, which was the 2018 Farm Act. And that is an insurance product that offers producers additional insurance coverage for losses that fall under the levels generally covered by standard crop insurance policies. SEO coverage offers an alternative for eligible producers who elect not to participate in the Agricultural Risk Coverage Program under Title I of the Agricultural Act of 2014. The program will allow producers to cover a portion of the deductible of their underlying crop insurance policy with payments being determined on an area, generally county, basis. SCO was made available beginning with the 2015 crop year. The program provides subsidies of 65% of producers' premiums. Like traditional crop insurance, SCO is not subject to payment limitations or adjusted gross income eligibility limits. And then there's the Stacked Income Protection Plan, which was introduced in the Agricultural Act of 2014 and continued under the 2018 Farm Act. It provides county-based revenue insurance policies to producers of upland cotton beginning with the 2015 crop. Unlike SCO, STAX policies can be purchased on their own or be used to supplement insurance coverage available through the federal crop insurance program, protecting against losses that fall within the range not generally covered by standard crop insurance policies, although on a county rather than an individual farm revenue basis. Federal subsidies will cover 80% of producers' premiums. Similar to SEO, STAX is not subject to any payment or income limitations. Under provisions of the 2018 Farm Act, farms on which seed cotton-based acres are enrolled in the ARC or price loss coverage programs will be ineligible to purchase STAX policies for cotton production on that farm. And then there's the price loss coverage program which was introduced in the Agricultural Act of 2014 as well, and continued with the 2018 Farm Act. It provides income support payments to producers with historical base acres of wheat, feed grains, rice, oil seeds, peanuts, and pulses on a commodity-by-commodity -commodity basis when market prices fall below a reference price. Seed cotton, ungent cotton, was made eligible for PLC payments by the 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act, which continue in the 2018 Farm Act. The payment rate is the difference between the reference price and the annual national average market price, or marketing loan rate, if higher. The 2018 Farm Act introduced an effective reference price that allows the statutory reference price to increase up to 15% when the previous five-year average of market prices is above the statutory price. The payment amount is the payment rate multiplied by the historical acres of covered commodity up to 85% of the farm's base acres for that commodity, multiplied by the payment yield. The 2018 Farm Act allows a one-time opportunity to update the farm's historical payment yields for base acres of covered commodities. Payments will be reduced on an acre-by-acre -acre basis for producers who plant fruits, vegetables, or wild rice on base acres. And then we have the Agricultural Risk Coverage Program, which was introduced in the Act of 2014 and again continued with the 2018 Farm Act. It provides income support payments to producers with historical base acres of wheat, feed grains, rice, oil seeds, peanuts, and pulses on a commodity-by-commodity -commodity basis when country crop revenue 
Actual average country yield times national farm price or effective reference price if higher. Drops below 86% of benchmark revenue. Five-year Olympic average county yield times five-year Olympic average national price. Seed cotton, ungin cotton, was made eligible for ARC payments by the 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act, which continues in the 2018 Farm Act. Producers may also choose to participate in ARC based on individual farm revenue instead of county revenue. In this case, the payment is based on the difference between individual benchmark and actual individual revenues. The benchmark is calculated as the sum of average revenue for each covered commodity on all farms enrolled in individual ARC in which the individual has a financial interest divided by the average acres planted to all covered commodities on all those farms. Payments are limited to 60% of the farm's historical base acres. And then actively engaged producers on a farm, which is a category defined by the Secretary of Agriculture as part of the 2014 Farm Act implementation, make a one-time decision for the farm's base acres on whether to elect PLC or county-based ARC coverage, the 2018 Farm Act requires a unanimous election to obtain PLC or ARC CO on a covered commodity by commodity basis, which may remain in effect for the 2019 through 2023 crop years. An election of ARC IC will apply to all covered commodities on the farm, starting with the 2021 crop year and each crop year thereafter through 2023. The producers on a farm may change the election of PLC or ARC on a year to year basis. And then there's non-insured crop disaster assistance program, which are payments that are made to producers of crops for which crop insurance is unavailable in that county. NAP was created by the 1994 Federal Crop Insurance Reform Act and originally contained an area yield loss trigger in addition to a farm yield loss trigger. The area yield loss requirement was eliminated in the Agricultural Risk Protection Act of 2000. The Agricultural Act of 2014 expanded the program by allowing additional coverage above catastrophic levels for commodities that otherwise would not have additional coverage available to them. Producers pay a service fee for basic coverage of 50% of the crop at 55% of the price and a premium fee of 5.25% of the liability for up to 65% of the crop at 100% of the price. Payments under NAP cannot exceed $125,000 per individual or entity for a single crop year. And then there's marketing assistance loans that allow farmers to obtain a short-term, usually up to nine months, low-interest loan for their harvested commodity at the posted county loan rate with the option of repaying at a lower rate with interest waived if the posted county market price falls below the loan rate. Producers also have the option to forfeit their commodities under loan as full payment of their loan. Producers who choose not to take out a loan may receive the same benefit by collecting a direct loan deficiency payment on their harvested commodity equal to the difference between the loan rate and the market price. So those are just a long list of different like risk management programs that are out there for farmers. And then we're going to just kind of look here at some risk management strategies. So farmers have many options. And again, this is from USDA. So farmers have many options for managing the risks they face, and most producers use a combination of strategies and tools. Some strategies deal with only one kind of risk, while others address multiple risks following are some of the more widely used strategies. So enterprise diversification assumes incomes from different crops and livestock activities do not move up and down in perfect correlation so that low income from some activities would likely be offset by higher income from others. Financial leverage refers to the use of borrowed funds to help finance the farm business. Higher levels of debt relative to net worth are generally considered riskier. The optimal amount of leverage depends on several factors, including farm profitability, the cost of credit, tolerance for risk, and the degree of uncertainty in income. Vertical integration generally decreases risk associated with the quantity and quality of inputs or outputs because the vertically integrated firm retains ownership or control of a commodity across two or more phases of production and or marketing. Contracting can reduce risk by guaranteeing prices, market outlets, or other terms of exchange in advance. Contracts that set price, quality, and amount of product to be delivered 
are called marketing contracts or simply forward contracts, contracts that prescribe production process processes to be used and or specify who provides inputs are called production contracts. Hedging uses futures or options contracts to reduce the risk of adverse price changes prior to an anticipated cash sale or purchase of a commodity. Liquidity refers to the farmer's ability to generate cash quickly and efficiently in order to meet financial obligations. Liquidity can be enhanced by holding cash, stored commodities, or other assets that can be converted to cash on short notice without incurring a major loss. Crop yield insurance pays indemnities to producers when yields fall below the producer's insured yield level. Coverage may be provided through private hail insurance or federally subsidized multiple peril crop insurance. Crop revenue insurance pays indemnities to farmers based on gross revenue shortfalls instead of just yield or price shortfalls. Several federally subsidized revenue insurance plans are available for major crops in most areas of the United States. Household off-farm employment or investment can provide a more certain income stream to the farm household to supplement income from the farming operation. And most producers use a variety of farm management strategies and tools, and since risks and the willingness and ability to bear risks differ from farm to farm, so do the risk management strategies used. So, some more things we got here. Some more policies, I guess. The Internal Revenue Code 170E3 of 2011 provides enhanced tax deductions to businesses to encourage donations of fit and wholesome food to qualified nonprofit organizations serving the poor and needy. Qualified business taxpayers can deduct the cost to produce the food and half the difference between the cost and full fair market value of the donated food. In December of 2015, the U.S. Congress passed the Protecting Americans from Tax Hikes Act, making permanent and extending the enhanced tax deductions to all businesses, including C-corporations, S-corporations, limited liability corporations or LLCs, partnerships, and sole proprietorships. The U.S. Federal Food Donation Act of 2008 specifies procurement contract language that encourages the donation of excess wholesome food to eligible nonprofits to feed food and secure people in the United States. And there is liability protection for businesses that wish to donate food. The Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act of 1996 provides limited liability protection for persons who make good faith donations to nonprofits that feed the hungry. The term person includes farmers, grocers, wholesalers, hotels, manufacturers, restaurants, caterers, schools, and others. Food donations must still comply with applicable state and local health, food handling, and food safety laws and regulations. So, for example, packaging that may be opened or damaged should not be donated. In 2018, for the first time ever, Congress included measures in the Farm Bill to reduce food waste. So, for example, they clarified liability protections for food donors, financing food recovery from farms, encouraging food waste recycling through community compost funding, and better coordinating food waste reduction efforts across the federal government. And the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has set legal limits on nitrate and drinking water. And unfortunately, these limits are often exceeded. In 1974, Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act, and this law requires the EPA to determine safe levels of chemicals in drinking water, which do or may cause health problems. These non-enforceable levels, based solely on possible health risks and exposure, are called maximum contaminant level goals. So the MCLG, maximum contaminant level goals, for nitrates has been set at 10 parts per million or ppm and for nitrites at 1 ppm because the EPA believes this level of protection would not cause any of the potential health problems. And with nitrate, you can't taste, smell, or see it in drinking water. So nitrate can cause damage to your health, and this includes 
methemoglobinemia. Uh, this is also known as blue baby syndrome. The way blood carries oxygen is affected in this disorder. So the highest group, the highest risk group for this disorder is babies that are under six months old who are bottle fed. Anemia, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, sepsis, glucose 6-phosphate, dehydrogenase deficiency, and other metabolic problems can put people at a high risk of developing this disorder after nitrate exposure as well. So it can cause a bluish tone to the skin, and this is known as cyanosis, and it can lead to serious illness, seizures, coma, or even death. And other symptoms include increased heart rate, headaches, stomach cramps, uh, decreased blood pressure, vomiting, pallor, or an unhealthy pale appearance, fatigue or weakness, central nervous system depression, metabolic acid doses, or excessive acid in the body, and dysrhythmia, which is an abnormal or irregular heartbeat. So more and more studies are showing that abdominal cramps, increased heart rate, and headaches are associated with nitrate and nitrate exposure. Select studies suggest that nitrate or nitrite exposure is linked to an increased risk of cancer, especially gastric cancer. Uh, however, there's not a scientific consensus on this yet. And then federal policy incentives encourage systems of farming, in particular, an over-reliance on annual crops such as corn that leave soil bare half the year and require nitrogen fertilizers to maximize profits that cause costly damage to the nation's soil, water, and air resources. And then some other things that I thought were, we could just look into too. So we there's corporate and private investment and that is an article from aei.org it's called the farm bill remains a case study in corporate welfare where is partisanship when you need it by vincent h smith so Partisanship has many downsides, but one upside is that most often when committees have hearings, Republicans and Democrats choose witnesses with different perspectives. This provides the committee members, the media, and the public with good arguments coming from different viewpoints, enabling each side to choose their champions to make the best case in the public square. Unfortunately, this important check and balance is completely missing from House and Senate Agricultural Committees, where Democrat and Republican committee members are in full agreement to only present one perspective in their hearings and vigorously prevent any dissent. So bankers wandered through the hearing, claiming they would not be able to make credit available to farmers without the crop revenue guarantees underwritten by the federal crop insurance program. Those bankers, along with representatives from the crop insurance lobby, omitted to mention that lenders are more than happy to make loans to ranchers who raise cattle, not crops, and hog and poultry producers without a guaranteed government backstop. All those businesses manage farm operations with highly volatile incomes and costs, face difficult to predict periodic shortfalls in their revenues, and generally do not have access to heavily subsidized agricultural insurance. They receive bank loans, profitable to the lenders, are able to survive, and when managed responsibly, succeed. Most of the entrepreneurs who own and manage the largest 15% of farm businesses, consistently receiving over 85% of all crop insurance and those other subsidy payments, like to be seen as family farmers. Certainly, a fair number do live on the farms they own. However, on average, over 80% of farm family household incomes come from other non-farm businesses, non-farm financial investments, and non-farm employment activities. For most of the farm business owners who receive farm subsidies, farming is a part-time activity that gives them access to the lifestyles they want and, over the long haul, to substantial increases in their wealth with minimal long-run business risk related to their farm operations. Fewer than 1 in 200 farm businesses close in any given year because of bankruptcies or foreclosures. 
And that is not quite the picture painted by farm lobbies or congressional members from farm state constituencies when farm groups, crop insurance companies, and rural lenders bring their pitches to congressional hearings. In fact, it corresponds more closely to the image of an industry heavily involved in seeking corporate welfare via crony capitalism practices. And then another thing, so that was corporate private investment. And then another thing to look into is foreign farm owners. And uh, this is from Congressional Research Service informing the legislative debate since 1914. It's called Foreign Ownership and Holdings of U.S. Agricultural Land. So, current federal law imposes no restrictions on the amount of private U.S. agricultural land that can be foreign-owned. Federal law requires foreign persons and entities to disclose to USDA information related to foreign investment and ownership of U.S. agricultural land. The Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act of 1978, as implemented by USDA, established a nationwide system for collecting information pertaining to foreign ownership of U.S. agricultural land defined as land used for forestry production, farming, ranching, or timber production. The AFIDA defines a foreign person to include any individual, corporation, company, association, partnership, society, joint stock, company, trust, estate, or any other legal entity, including any foreign government, under the laws of a foreign government, or with the principal place of business outside the United States. The regulations require foreign persons who buy, sell, or gain interest in U.S. agricultural land to disclose their holdings and transactions to USDA directly or to the Farm Service Agency County office where the land is located. Failure to disclose this information may result in penalties and fines. After their original disclosure, each subsequent change of ownership or use must be reported. USDA comply, compiles these data with the most recent AFDA report covering 2021. Foreign persons or entities may be eligible for certain USDA farm program benefits if they meet the same requirements as domestic persons or entities. Specifically, they must be considered actively engaged in farming, meaning they are either farming the land or landlord renting land under a crop share agreement. They also must have the requisite U.S. taxpayer ID and meet the program's eligibility requirements. Other criteria may apply, such as limits on the entity's adjusted gross income. Current law imposes no restrictions on foreign persons or entities with respect to eligibility for crop and livestock insurance premium subsidies. Some programs make no distinction about a producer's or owner's citizenship, and other programs have no explicit citizenship requirement. Foreign persons or entities are not eligible for permanent disaster assistance programs. The non-insured crop disaster assistance program explicitly prohibits payments to foreign entities other than resident aliens. And then we'll, so that was the existing federal requirements. We'll look at some existing state requirements. So some states and localities have instituted restrictions on foreign ownership of farm land, an overview of state laws by researchers at the University of Arkansas's National Agricultural Law Center shows that no U.S. state has instituted an absolute prohibition on foreign ownership. However, some states limit or have proposed to prohibit certain foreign persons and entities from acquiring or owning an interest in agricultural land within their state, and several states have separate disclosure requirements within their state. The USDA has identified 339 counties in Iowa, Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin as having the strictest prohibitions on foreign ownership of agricultural land and other non-agricultural real estate. There is no single uniform approach under state laws to addressing foreign ownership. Some general categories include restrictions on the amount of land that can be owned or the duration of ownership. Distinctions involving private versus public land or how agricultural land is defined. Distinctions involving resident slash non-resident aliens. Inheritance considerations involving land ownership. Restrictions on ownership by foreign corporations. And differences related to enforcement and penalties. And then we'll just look here at the USDA data on foreign ownership. So the USDA reports that foreign persons and entities held an interest in 40.8 million acres of U.S. agricultural land in 2021, accounting for 3.1% of total privately owned land. These data cover agricultural land and non-agricultural land. In 2021, forest land accounted for 47% of all foreign-owned land. Cropland accounted for 29% and pasture and other agricultural land for 22 percent. 
non-agricultural land, such as homesteads and roads, accounted for 2%. The USDA reports that foreign land holdings have increased by an average of 2.2 million acres per year since 2015. Data cover both foreign-owned, 29.1 million acres, and U.S. subsidiary-owned land, which is 11.7 million acres. Five countries accounted for approximately 62% of all foreign-owned U.S. agricultural land in 2021. As a share of all foreign-owned acres, these were Canada, 31%, mostly forest land, the Netherlands with 12%, Italy, 7%, the United Kingdom, 6%, and Germany, 6%. Other countries with holdings of more than 500,000 acres were Portugal, France, Denmark, Luxembourg, Mexico, Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, Japan, and Belgium. All U.S. states report foreign investments slash ownership in U.S. land as of year-end 2021. According to the USDA, the states with the most foreign-owned agricultural acreage were Texas with 5.3 million acres, Maine with 3.6 million acres, Colorado with 1.9 million acres, Alabama with 1.8 million acres, and Oklahoma with 1.7 million acres. Other states with more than 1 million foreign-owned acres were Arkansas, California, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Louisiana, Michigan, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington. Users of USDA's AFIDA data have noted inaccuracies in underreporting under current disclosure requirements. The Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting asserts that data collected under AFIDA are not complete, contain errors and omissions, do not track sales of foreign-held U.S. farmland, and may not accurately reflect changes over time. For example, 7.5% of the AFIDA reported foreign-held acres were for country not listed. Combining reporting codes 998, no foreign investor listed, and 999, no predominant country code. Limited information is available on AFIDA reported data covering land held by certain countries known to provide certain tax-neutral jurisdictions for private equity firms, such as the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands. Some House members, including the chairman of the House Agricultural Committee, have asked the Government Accountability Office to conduct a review of AFIDA, including how the USDA collects data under AFIDA, how its collection methods have changed over time, how the USDA ensures accurate data disclosure, and how reporting requirements under AFIDA might be improved. There is also increased attention on the possible impact of foreign investment in the U.S. food and agricultural sector, particularly focused on Chinese investment following high-profile acquisitions in the past decade. In 2013, the Chinese firm WH Group acquired U.S. company Smithfield Foods, the world's largest pork producer. In 2022, Chinese food manufacturer Fufeng Group bought 300 acres of land near the Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota with plans to build a wet corn milling and biofermentation plant. Not including the Fufeng Group purchase in 2022, USDA reports that China accounted for 383,935 acres, or 0.9% of total foreign-owned U.S. agricultural land as of year-end 2021. So, as we can see, foreign farm owners are just something to keep in check. Or not in check. They're just, it's important to know about. Because I guess I obviously didn't know anything about that before we did our research. And while foreign farm owners may not necessarily contribute more or less to food waste per se, again, they just play an important role part in the discussion of food and potential policies that would be enacted because as anybody could they may also try to influence farming policies in their favor and while there is nothing obviously wrong with a foreign entity owning farmland in america because it there's nothing inherently wrong with that i do think that we should prioritize people living in america owning farmland and making profit off of it versus somebody who doesn't live in America making money be just mainly not because I have an issue obviously with people making money in other countries, but it's more so just while Americans are struggling 
it should be Americans who are making money in America versus not that foreign people can't or foreign entities, but if they aren't living in America and they're just using our land to make themselves even richer when a American could be benefiting from that, I do think we should prioritize the American having the chance to have a farm field. Not that all Americans necessarily want to start farms, I guess. So maybe that's not even an issue, but that was just something that I thought is that we should. And so in that sense, we should make it easier for, and I don't know how easy it is to set up, like, I don't know all the costs associated with starting farming, but that's something that maybe we should look into, like the government should look into too, make it easier for Americans to start farming. So then we're also going to move on to some current practices. And one of those is restaurants throw away a lot of food. Approximately 4 to 10% of food purchased by restaurants is wasted before reaching the consumer. Drivers of food waste at restaurants include oversized portions and flexibility of chain store management and extensive menu choices. And restaurants, there's a statistic, this is from the counter.org, that restaurants throw away almost 94% of their excess food. And then supermarkets, some issues there is overstocked product displays, expectations of cosmetic performance or perfection. So when it comes to fruits, nuts, and vegetables, the USDA has high standards for quality that is not based on nutritional value, but on appearance. Farmers have to figure out what to do when retailers decide their produce isn't right and gets rejected due to appearance. Cosmetic imperfection is one of the main causes for food waste, and what's particularly interesting is that following the USDA's high standards for quality is entirely voluntary. Yet, despite this global crisis, supermarkets continue to stock shelves with only a specific glistening quality of food, which not only results in food waste, but lost income for farmers. And then another thing is sell-by and use-by dates. So it's so my and used by dates uh, kind of started when consumers began producing less food on their own and they demanded information about how their food was made. And this led to the current system of food dating, which began in the 1970s. So most of us believe that expiration dates tell us when food becomes unsafe to consume. But in reality, these dates aren't related to the risk of foodborne illness or food poisoning. So manufacturers use these dates to indicate when food is at its peak, meaning that the food is not necessarily inedible after the expiration date has passed, especially for unrefrigerated foods. There may not even be a difference in quality or taste of expired food, nor does it mean that it will make you sick. So over 90% of Americans throw out food before it is spoiled, and 40% of food in the U.S. is thrown away or unused every year due to food dating. And while the FDA and U.S. Department of Agriculture technically are in control of managing the misbranding of food products, there is no national regulation over the use of these dates, with the exception of infant formula. And this is because as time goes on, the nutrients and formula lose their potency. So allowing states to self-regulate the use of these dates creates mass confusion for food producers, resulting in mass confusion that leads to more food waste. And there's a distinct difference between sell-by and used-by or best-by dates. So used-by and best-by dates indicate when the manufacturer deems that the product reaches its peak freshness, and it doesn't indicate spoilage or safety of consumption. This is for consumer use. But sell-by dates are for manufacturer and retailer use, not consumer use. To ensure proper turnover of products in the stores, this stocking and marketing tool is used so that there's a long shelf life after the consumer purchases the product. Experts say these dates shouldn't even be visible to the consumer as it can confuse them into wasting more food. And one solution is for the food industry to change the way they date labels, such as dating when food is most likely to spoil. However, a better solution is for Congress to set national standards to a single set of dating requirements that is consistent and displays when the food will spoil. And just continuing off of that, frequently misunderstood. So 
As mentioned, people frequently misunderstand date labels and interpret them to be indicators of safety leading to unnecessary waste. And some states even restrict or forbid the sale of donation of past date foods that are still safe to donate and eat. And they recommend, so it is recommended that the 2023 Farm Bill should standardize date labels through the miscellaneous title or a new, new food waste reduction title. And then just some more on sell-by dates. A survey conducted by Respect Food reported that 63% of people don't know the difference between used by and best before. And they said used by dates indicate perishable items and best before can be eaten after the given date but won't be at its highest quality. And then another issue just with supermarkets is damaged goods, outdated promotional items, and unpopular items that also get thrown away. And then there's also some errors in industrial processing and keeping up with the food safety policies. So food safety protocol is a large factor of food waste. Uh, there's no room for error given to industrial processing or anything else that diminishes the quality of the food, the final food product. Confusions and errors during industrial processing lead to food items that don't meet certain standards being wasted as a result of this. And no error margins can be established by food processing companies due to the high level of food safety regulations. Even small errors will lead to food being unsellable and thus wasted. These errors can even include imperfection in appearance or shape of the food. Trial runs, production trials, wrong sizes and weights, overcooking, and packaging defects are just some aspects that result in imperfection and rejection of these foods. And constraints include lack of proper management, insufficient finances, and technical difficulties with storage, harvesting methods, cooling problems, and adverse weather conditions, infrastructure, marketing systems, processing, and packaging. These all contribute to food waste, especially in developing countries. Why it matters, why we should care. So to start decreasing food waste can lessen the need for new food production, shrinking projected deforestation, biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution, and water scarcity. Food waste results in a waste of resources, including the agricultural land, water, pesticides, fertilizers, and energy, and the generation of environmental impacts, including these greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, consumption and degradation of freshwater resources, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, and degradation of soil quality and air quality. Implementation of food waste solutions has the potential to generate 73 billion dollars in annual net financial benefit, recover the equivalent of 4 billion meals for food insecure individuals, save 4 trillion gallons of water, and avoid 75 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. But, uh, oh, and we're also going to mention the adverse effects of current practices as to why it matters. So the way we harvest, produce, process, market, transport, and consume food can make farming difficult for smallholder farming or smallholder farms. Smallholder farms are agricultural holdings that are smaller than a farm and they produce 80% of the food that we eat. Yet they remain in poverty and face challenges from conflict, climate change, and even the COVID-19 pandemic. Food and agriculture make up roughly one-third of greenhouse gas emissions and are the main cause of soil degradation and biodiversity loss. And then we'll talk about water and with that contaminated water. And to do that, we're going to have to talk about nitrogen fertilizer runoff. Nitrogen slash fertilizer runoff. So nitrogen fertilizer over application and leaving the soil bare. Under, the condi under these conditions on typical Midwestern farms, large amounts of applied nitrogen can leach through the soil, run off fields, and end up in waterways and drinking supplies. Nitrogen and phosphorus can run downstream from farm fields, ending up in coastal waters and the Great Lakes where it decimates fish and shellfish numbers. 
coastal waters, including the Gulf of Mexico and the Chesapeake Bay, are plagued by hypoxia, a phenomenon in which aquatic ecosystems are deprived of oxygen because of rapid microbial growth due to excess nutrients, including nitrogen, which, as we just mentioned, has negative impacts on fish and shellfish. Toxic algae blooms due to excess nutrients are also causing problems for coastal tourism and recreation. It's expensive to treat water contaminated with any of this fertilizer runoff. The USDA Economic Research Services has estimated the annual cost of removing nitrate from U.S. water supplies exceeds $4.8 billion. It's estimated that if we reduce nitrate concentrations in source waters by just 1%, That could help reduce water treatment costs by $120 million per year. And then we just have... So, this is a... I guess you could call it an article, sort of, from the EPA. And it's estimated nitrate concentrations in groundwater used for drinking. So, nitrate in groundwater... Drinking water systems is of concern because private self-supplied drinking water systems, which primarily draw from groundwater, are not federally regulated. It is the owner's responsibility to test and treat their own well for nitrate and other pollutants. While nitrate does occur naturally in groundwater, concentrations greater than 3 milligrams per liter generally indicate contamination. And a more recent nationwide study found that concentrations over 1 milligram per liter of nitrate indicate human activity. EPA's maximum cons- contaminant level, or MCL, for nitrate set to protect against baby blue syndrome, or blue baby syndrome, is 10 milligrams per liter. The data in this indicator show the total area and percent of state area predicted to have nitrate concentrations exceeding this, or half of, or actually not exceeding the 10 milligrams, exceeding 5 milligrams, which is half of the EPA's MCL, in groundwater used for drinking. Also presented is the estimated percent of state population served by self-supplied drinking water, 98% of which is from groundwater wells. So I'm not going to go through every state here, but I'll let you guys kind of go through or pause, I guess, or I'll have it set up somehow to where you guys can see and then can pause it and kind of find your state and then It'll tell you the estimated area of state with groundwater nitrate concentrations above the 5 milligrams, estimated percent of state area with groundwater nitrate concentrations above... Okay, so the first one is miles squared. The second column is percentage. And then the last column is estimated percent of population with self-supplied drinking water. So there's that chart. And then we'll talk about air quality and global warming. And why that's important is because methane gets released from food in landfills. According to the EPA, food is the single largest category of material placed in municipal landfills where it emits methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. Municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of human-related methane emissions in the United States, accounting for approximately 14.1% of these emissions in 2017. The greenhouse gas emissions embodied in the food wasted by consumers and consumer-facing businesses account for more than 260 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year which is equivalent to the annual emissions of 66 coal-fired power plants. Food waste prevention policies have the potential to annually divert nearly 7 million tons from landfills while generating more than $27.4 billion each year in net financial benefit. And excess nitrogen can also volatize into the air. When food waste breaks down, it also produces nitrogen, which, when exposed to air, forms nitrate, which can then leach into the groundwater, as we talked about before. 
So then we'll talk about some harmful effects from fertilizers, which include ozone damage to crops and forests, acidification and over-enrichment of aquatic ecosystems, impairment of public drinking water supplies, biodiversity losses, visibility impairing haze, global warming. It's estimated that nitrogen from agriculture costs Americans $157 billion a year and damages to both human health and the environment. And you may be wondering, what about human health? Well, diseases. Due primarily to the reduction of ingested nitrate. So, basically, when you ingest nitrate which is what we've been talking about, it gets turned into nitrite. That nitrite then reacts with hemoglobin to form methemoglobin, which does not transport oxygen to the tissues or to the rest of your body. Nitrate contamination in the drinking water has been linked to some other illnesses, such as blue baby syndrome, as we mentioned, various types of cancer, as we mentioned, and inflammatory bowel disease. And another reason why this matters, why food loss and waste matters just in general, is that because people, as we have briefly mentioned, there's a lot of food insecure people in America. And I have here just a brief excerpt, I guess you could say, from the USDA uh, food security article link. And that just kind of talks about food insecurity. So, USDA supports global food security through in-country capacity building, basic and applied research, and support for improved market information, statistics, and analysis. With 870 million people around the world who do not have access to a sufficient supply of nutritious and safe food, establishing global food security is important not only to hundreds of millions of hungry people, but also to the sustainable economic growth of these nations and the long-term economic prosperity of the United States. As we help countries become more food secure and raise incomes, we also expand markets for American producers. U.S. agricultural exports to developing countries in Southeast Asia, Central America, and Sub-Saharan Africa have grown at more than twice the annual rate as compared to developed countries. U.S. poultry meat exports to Sub-Saharan Africa expanded 180% from 2009 to 2011. Given population growth and rising incomes, it is estimated that the demand for food will rise by 70 to 100% by 2050. To meet this need, The United Nations estimates that production in developing countries will need to almost double. So as of 2022, we globally produce about 150% more food with just 13% more land compared with what we were producing in 1960. Many innovations in food production we've made since then have contributed to this. We could feed one point time, sorry, we could feed 1.5 times the global population or 10 billion people with the amount of food we currently produce. And 2.3 billion people in the world were moderately or severely food insecure, while almost 3.1 billion people could not afford a healthy diet in 2020. One misconception about food insecurity is that it only includes hunger. And while hunger is a large portion of this, uh, food insecurity also does include micronutrient deficiencies and being overweight or obesity and when food is wasted so too is the land water labor energy and other inputs that are used in producing processing transporting preparing storing and disposing of the discarded food water use while raising animals and growing crops is extremely intensive Agriculture accounts for 70% of the world's water use. And food losses translate into lost income for farmers and higher prices for consumers, giving us an economic incentive to reduce food waste. And 
Researchers estimate that halving U.S. food loss waste could reduce the environmental footprint of the current cradle-to-consumer food, su- food supply chain by more than 300,000 square kilometers or 75 million acres of agricultural land, which is an area greater than Arizona, 12 trillion liters or 3.2 trillion gallons of blue water, which is equal to the annual water use of 29 million American homes, nearly 290,000 metric tons or 640 million pounds of bioavailable nitrogen from agricultural fertilizer with the potential to reach a body of water, cause algal blooms, and deteriorate water quality. 940 million GJ or 262 billion kWh of energy, enough to power 21.5 million U.S. homes for a year. 92 million metric tons of CO2 equal to the annual CO2 emissions from 23 coal-fired power plants. These savings are only able to be achieved through prevention, though. Recycling of food waste, while still important, cannot achieve these benefits since a substantial fraction of the impacts, all the co- like the land and the water and all that is used during the primary production of food. So while recycling wouldn't help, um, we wouldn't see those results with recycling initiatives alone. Recycling initiatives are still good to look at, but it's also important to look at as well things that we can do in the beginning stages, I guess I would say. We're just going to be discussing some different things, whether policies or other, that could potentially be done to help reduce food loss and waste and help people. So to start that off, tax breaks are write-offs for businesses who donate food that they would otherwise be throwing away. Could be to a homeless shelter or food bank as long as it's a legitimate organization that helps everyone in the community and doesn't discriminate against those they help is something that I would have recommended. But obviously, as we discussed, there are some policies that, a lot of policies actually, that do encourage corporations and businesses to donate food but the biggest issue is the utilization of it is the hard part whether that's due to finding an organization who can take the food or being able to store the food that you were going to throw away to keep it from spoiling so that you could donate it so i'd say after kind of learning that understanding that a big area the government could potentially focus on is those aspects, whether that's encouraging private citizens to start up companies that would assist in those areas or just creating the building slash infrastructure themselves. Personally, I think it would be better paying the government since something like this would should not be for profit. But I know that there are quite a few people who would be frightened and think the government was taking over or heading towards communism. So I guess to me, although I do feel it would potentially be better managed under the government, since it wouldn't have to be a business, it could more so be a program. I'm up for either if it actually helps to reduce food waste and help feed people. Some other things under kind of just helping people know how to donate is help charities utilize the type of food waste restaurants generate. So that could be like produce trims, prepared food. So just teaching them how to use those kind of scraps, I guess, and turn them into food. You could educate restaurants about how to donate and then use technology to match supply and demand so that well-intentioned suppliers can find a home for their excess. And such as apps that are able to help nonprofits locate donors, helping get the excess food where it needs to be. And I know that there are some apps out there that are being developed, or maybe some are already developed that are have that goal in mind to help with that. So that's awesome to see. And then another thing is incentives for farmers to grow more useful crops and stop encouraging overproduction of crops that we already have too much of or don't really need. 
So for that, we could reduce federal crop insurance premium subsidies that drive over-reliance on corn, soybeans, wheat, and other annual commodity crops. They could utilize smarter fertilization application methods. So improved fertilization management systems with more, more precise rates and timing would decrease nitrogen pollution by approximately 10%. But farming systems that incorporate year-round plant cover to protect the soil can reduce nitrogen losses by a much greater percentage, between 42 and 85 percent. Producing incentives, so another thing they could do for like farmers is producing incentives and technical assistance to adopt various practices both within and at the edges of their fields, such as drainage water management, shallow drainage wetlands, bioreactors, and buffers. There's this method of strategically positioned prairie strips that I read an article about that also shows that it can help kind of more so with reducing, I think it was the fertilizer um, runoff and stuff, but that's obviously still, we want that. And then increase funding and technical assistance to encourage on-farm conservation practices and ensure their adoption as a condition for receiving federal farm subsidies. So they could increase funding for existing conservation systems that are at this time currently underfunded. They could improve enforcement of conservation compliance and facilitate adoption of innovative systems such as prairie strips or other many other systems too. So then another thing I thought of mainly for just to try to help with obviously food insecurity is kind of like Medicare for all, we could create like a food for all system. And I know, I feel there would be a lot of people against that, but I just feel at the end of the day, if it is what helps American citizens the most, then it would be very beneficial. Yeah, because providing free healthy food for people in need would also increase our productivity as a country, uh, people aren't going to be as productive if they're starving. Yeah. And then another thing we should always do when talking about anything but food loss and waste as well as looking at other countries and seeing what they're doing. So I found some information and it's from 2015. So there might have been changes to some of these policies. But uh, this is information I found on a few different countries. So India enacted the National Food Security Act, and this allows people to have access to publicly financed or subsidized food. Uh, they will distribute coarse grains along with having a high nutritional value. Coarse grains are highly resistant to extreme climate events such as floods and droughts. So over 31 million farmers grow these crops in India, and including these in the act will most likely stimulate production, helping with food security and climate adaptation. The farmers will increase their income by providing these crops to the government, and this will help address hunger, poverty, and climate change. So an organization in Kenya is helping farmers to produce more milk out of their cows with fewer greenhouse gas emissions. They do this by showing farmers how to improve their livestock feeding practices. This allows farmers to reduce their herds, which also make these smaller herds more productive than the previous larger herds. So this means that the cows are producing much more milk than they did before. So the cows receive a protein-rich feed for this to happen. In Colombia, they face extreme weather conditions, primarily floods and droughts, and these wipe out crops and render them useless. A knowledge exchange with farmers in Senegal has been helping these farmers to adapt to these rough conditions. The Senegalese farmers are indigenously knowledgeable when it comes to coping with long droughts. In some areas, the National Meteorological, Meteorological Agency is working with farmers to make their seasonal climate forecast more accurate and making these forecasts available via radio or SMS text. The Colombian government has been inspired to collaborate with national growers associations, the National Agriculture Research System, local experts, and non-governmental organizations. They are focused on improving the climate as well as site-specific information for farmers to incorporate into how they plan 
and strategize their farming. So almost 160,000 farmers now receive improved climate advice in Colombia. This allows them to better equip themselves to make decisions about what, when, and where they plan crops. The project aims to reach over 1.5 million farmers. And 25% of Colombian farmers are women, so giving them equitable access to this information helps improve issues of equality in farming as well. And then finally, in Nigeria, they recognize the 14.5 million smallholder farms will see their income decrease drastically when climate change or climate disasters occur. In response to this, the government has promised to ensure their farmers against extreme weather events. The International Research Institute for Climate and Society and the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center are working with Nigeria on a four-year plan to guide them towards reaching the goal of national smallholder coverage. So a similar program is already in place in India. Farmers are covered with index-based weather insurance, so when predetermined weather events occur, farmers are automatically paid. And these weather events include maintaining a certain temperature for a long period of time or reaching certain levels of rainfall. New rainfall triggers in India have been developed, and these triggers are specific to different crops and areas, and it's helped nearly one million farmers. And then in France, in 2016, made it illegal for retailers to throw away food and incentivizes them to partner with NGOs to give food to those in need. The law comes with fines of up to 3,700 euros. In 2016 again, Italy also put a law in place that allows businesses to escape sanctions for donating food past the sell-by dates, as well as allowing for tax incentives for the food donated. And then South Korea is also at the forefront of mitigating waste. In 2013, the government made residents in Seoul, Seoul pay Seoul, Seoul, in S E O U L, <laughs> pay for recycling depending on how much food waste they were creating. Another option for things that we can do is that food waste can be turned into boot, into renewable energy. Using a process called anaerobic digestion, food waste is treated at a special AED plant where it's broken down into a methane-rich biogas that is then used to create new energy. There are some companies that are already utilizing this method, and other countries are also figuring out ways to turn waste into a renewable energy. For example, Costa Rica generates a lot of waste through coffee production and has been using technology to turn it into heat and power. South Korea has been a massive example of harnessing the power of food waste for that and fertilizer. Food waste can also be turned into livestock feed, and that benefits farmers by reducing feed costs and disposal costs. And then composting, that is the act of recycling food waste and other organic waste into a valuable fertilizer that can help enrich soil and plants by providing a lot of nutrients. Enriched soil has a lot of environmental benefits like capturing water to help mitigate droughts, recycling nutrients, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And there are 20 states, uh, that might have changed by now I guess, but 20 states, at least 20 states, have composting facilities. So with composting, um, if something was alive at any point, it will compost, but not everything should be composted. You don't want to compost foods containing animal fats like meat, bones, cheese, grease, and oils. Uh, you don't want to compost plants infected with disease, invasive weeds, weeds that have gone to seed, or dog and cat feces. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that would work with the feces anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's good though. That I guess I wouldn't have known that, but that's good to know. So don't do that, guys. That's not good. It doesn't even, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, so another thing that we can look into with what we can do is how we as consumers can help mitigate food loss and waste. So some of those things are keeping an inventory of 
the food that you currently have in your house and then take it shopping. So basically you make a list of what you have in your house, whatever your food you usually use or whatever you know you're going to need if you're making recipes, whatever. Write that down and then take that with you when you go shopping so that you don't overbuy, so that you don't think maybe I don't have this at home and then you buy it and then you do leading to either you're not using it one of them and one of them getting thrown away or just I don't know mainly just the um, waste you don't want to waste food and then with that you can plan your meals so that you make sure to utilize the food you buy buy ugly food and understand the difference between sell by expiration and just understand what all those dates mean and then ensure that you properly store your food so with garlic potatoes onions tomatoes and cucumbers you should never refrigerate those things uh, these items should be kept at room temperature and separating foods that produce more ethylene gas from those that do not also reduces food spoilage. So the ripening of foods is promoted by ethylene. This can cause spoilage. Uh, foods that produce this gas include peaches, pears, bananas, melons, and avocados. Another thing we as consumers can do is repurpose certain ingredients into soups or other meals and compost. And then I have another little, so this is from the USDA. It's just food waste activities. So the USDA is doing its part to help make preventing food waste the first best option for farmers, businesses, organizations, and consumers. There's a large number of programs contributing to this objective, ranging from those supporting market and distributional efficiencies to those educating consumers. So I'm just going to briefly mention, I think they, so there's information on funding opportunities for projects and research. So they, the USDA's rural development has developed a guide to programs that could potentially provide funding for food loss and waste reduction projects. And then the USDA's National Institute of Agricultural, Agricultural has developed a guide to programs that provide funding for research on food loss and waste. So if you're planning on doing a food waste reduction project or research, the USDA has guides to look into funding for those. Um, consumer education about food loss and waste is something they're working on. Consumer education about food storage, on-farm storage, uh, the support for rural counties, streamline procedures for donating wholesome misbranded meat and poultry products, connected fresh produce importers with charitable institutions, stimulate research and knowledge sharing about food loss and waste, innovation. And yeah, so those are just, if you want to kind of read more in depth about all those, again, this is on the usda.gov slash food waste slash activities. Just some different ways that, again, just some more ways, because the more things that we can do to help prevent food waste, the better off we will be financially and just health. Like just, it would just be better for everyone. Yeah. So I guess just my final thought on all this. Um, I just think that it's unacceptable that we're wasting so much food when people are starving. We could be, you know, there's a lot of people that are food insecure. And yet all this food still goes to waste. And I mean, I'm guilty of food waste. I think everybody in America is probably guilty of food waste. Um, I try my best to waste as little as possible, though. Uh, it just upsets me that America has so many resources to provide food to the hungry. And yet we don't do much to address this. We don't do enough to address this issue. I mean, charity isn't enough. Um, if charity was enough, charity is great and all, don't get me wrong, but it's not enough because if it were enough, we wouldn't have a problem with food insecurity. And I also just think a big contributing factor to why 
businesses don't donate their food is because um, it's cheaper to throw it away than to donate it. Because when you donate it, there's more labor involved and there's more transportation involved. And that comes out of the business's pocket. So that is probably something I think that should be addressed as well by your government and should be better regulated. Yeah, they may just have to increase those uh, tax breaks to account for that then, if they truly want yeah. the corporations to donate. I don't know what percent, like, I don't know how they, because they already have, like, the breaks and the donations that if you donate, you will get reimbursed for it. So I guess, like, but I do see, yeah, if they're not getting reimbursed for, enough, like, the transportation or storage costs, yeah, they're only getting reimbursed for the food itself, then I can see why it is going to be cheaper. I mean, it's still... I, almost unethical, in my opinion, that they're throwing away food that they know they could donate, even though it's yeah. going to cost them a little bit more out of their billion dollar profits. But, you know, whatever, fine. If they're not going to be good people, then yes, the government should kind of look into that and see how we can encourage these certain people to do the right thing. So we also just want to thank everyone who's been watching our stuff, liking and sharing it as well. Uh, we just want you to know we really do appreciate all of you. Yes. And we are just excited to have you guys along on this journey with us as we see where KSSP podcast goes. We're just super excited. But you guys can always leave a comment below if you have topic ideas you want to hear us discuss in future episodes. You can reach out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and we occasionally Twitch live stream. So follow us there to be notified when we do. And don't forget to give this video a like as well as follow or subscribe to our other social media accounts. And turn on notifications so that you get notified when our new content comes out. Otherwise, we will see you all tomorrow.